Can I welcome everyone to the 26th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? Can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of this meeting? Apologies have been received from Tavi Scott. And agenda item one is a decision on whether to take agenda item four on the work programme in private. Is everyone content that agenda item four is taken in private? Yeah? Thank you very much. The second item of business is two panels of evidence on the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill. This is the fifth meeting where we will be considering the bill. And we've already heard from the Scottish Government's bill team, members of the legal profession, health service professionals, local authority representatives in relation to education and social work, local authority representatives in relation to education uh, and social work again, nursery and early years education, and from the Information Commissioner's Office. In the first panel this week, we have a focus on those who will be required to consider sharing information with the named person, and the focus for the second panel is on children who are already involved with statutory agencies, whether it is looked after children or young offenders. I'll uh, start off the session by asking a couple of questions which are to the whole committee. Could you tell us the extent to which you expect your organisations will share information with a named person service? And is there anybody keen to start? Just to... Happy to start. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, um, as part of our regulatory work for the Care Inspectorate, um, we would not be um, sharing information directly with the name um, person service. Um, what our role we would see is as um, supporting and encouraging uh, service providers to um, share information appropriately with named persons. So when we're inspecting early years services, um, children's services, um, uh, in, on a regulatory basis, we will be encouraging them to build good relationships with named person services um, and be sharing information as appropriate with them. And that would be our, our main focus um, in terms of our regulatory responsibilities. In terms of our joint inspections of services for children, again, we will um, consider and we will become aware of uh, situations in which um, there are well-being concerns getting in the way of a child's development um, and our expectations there are that we will be um, uh, expecting, again, partnerships, service providers to take action appropriately on that and make decisions about when it's right to share information rather than us doing that directly with named person services. Thank you very much. Before anybody else um, responds to my question, can I apologise for not introducing you all first <laughs> and say that was Judith Tate, the Service Manager Strategic Scrutiny, Children and Justice Care Inspectorate. We also have Maggie Murphy, Senior Curriculum Manager, Glasgow Kelvin College and representative of College of Scotland, and Norman Conway, Detective Chief Inspector, Police Scotland, and Megan Farr, Policy Officer, Children and Young People's Commissioner, Scotland. Uh, and uh, thank you for answering that question. And I would ask that during the course of this session, if anybody wants to respond to a question, if they just try and catch my eye, that'd be great. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, could anybody else wish to respond? Sorry, you want um, the majority of our operations mean that we're not an information sharer, but we do have an inquiries line and we do get inquiries from children, young people, their parents, um, from professionals and sometimes from people who um, know the child in question. Um, unless there is a child protection concern, we don't share information without consent and we would expect that to continue to be the case. Um, we have uh, systems to record consent of the child um, and there's two parts to that, one giving us consent and the other giving um, the local authority or service provider consent to, to share information with us. Um, an example is that uh, last week we had a case where we were contacted by someone else in relation to a, an issue regarding a child. Um, didn't meet the child protection threshold, but it was significant of a concern for us to want to discuss it with the local authority, but we sought the consent of the, the, the young person um, before we contacted them. Um, we uh, would usually inform a child if we were going to share information, even if it was a child protection matter. And the only exception to that would be if the child or young person um, would be put at more risk by finding out. OK. Do you see yeah. comments? Uh, from the police, um, for, for ourselves, following the Supreme Court judgment, we've carried out quite a lot of work in terms of our concern hub practice. Um, 
really, really tightening up in terms of the duty to consider sharing information, justifying the share of that information with each different agency. And we would very much see the name person service as just one piece of the, the jigsaw uh, in terms of getting it right for every child. I think there's been some concerns uh, expressed that um, there would be an avalanche of information going towards the name person service. From a police perspective, that wouldn't be the case. Um, we would be looking at the best people in terms of sharing information, acting within the law, and some of that will be statutory agencies such as social work, maybe the name person service, but there's also opportunities within the third sector. Okay. Um, if from a college's point of view, um, in particular the college I represent, we support um, a high volume of vulnerable young people um, from 16 to 18. And many of them have um, statutory involvement with social work organisations and other support-based organisations. And as a result of that, we do share information. And we do it from a, a, a consent point of view, from the young persons uh, directly being involved. And we also do it from a, a person-centred point of view. But in terms of a college, we would share information um, for the safeguarding and betterment of that young person's um, involvement in, in college life. So we would do that and we would recognise the value of doing that on a fairly sustained basis. Okay. DCI Conway already talked on the next point about what sort of preparatory work in relation to the duty consider sharing information of your organisations done? In terms of, of uh, our college, we would support uh, members of staff through training, through safeguarding and corporate parenting and any changes in legislation they would be updated on. So staff had a, an understanding of the responsibility of duty of care um, from a safeguarding perspective. So um, it would be CPD for staff under safeguarding and corporate parent legislation accordingly. Okay, does anybody else want to come in at that point? Yes, um, we have looked at the duty to consider, but the reality is, is that we already consider <coughs> when we receive information from children, young people or other people, um, whether or not this is a child protection concern um, that's part of our normal processes already, and I think the evidence that's been heard previously suggests that's also the case for, for other organisations. Um, 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 our other concern around the duty to consider is it needs to be clear that this doesn't actually change the threshold at which non-consensual information sharing occurs. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, one last question then that I have is, in general, do you, do we you support the GIRFEC approach and the provisions of a universal named person service. Uh, and also, do you also agree that information share sharing is important if you're to succeed in the objective of improving outcomes for children and young people in Scotland? I fundamentally agree. The college does take a GIRFEC approach and we record young people's attainment and success using scenario indicators. Um, so we, we full, fully and wholeheartedly embrace that. And it is case studies where young people have had multiple agencies in their lives whilst at college and we've shared appropriate information that those young people have gone on to thrive and succeed and articulate well. So we would certainly embrace that. Okay. Likewise, we support getting it right for every child and we support the name person scheme. Um, it will make a significant contribution to the realisation of children's rights in Scotland. It gives children and young people and their families a single point of contact to access services, and that's a, an improvement on, um, on situations that occur at the moment. Um, we supported the Named Person Scheme um, in our, the joint letter from children's organisations that was uh, sent to the government in uh, June 2016. Um, but we have raised concerns around information sharing and the potential that information th sharing thresholds were lowered um, during the passage of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014. Um, um, so we did support the arguments that clanchild law made in relation to the uh, information sharing and, and concern for children's privacy. Okay, thank you. We would certainly welcome the policy intention of the bill. We support the general principles that are to support practitioners in clarifying their understanding of the right point at which information should be shared below the child protection threshold. Um, and we also welcome the recognition of professional, the importance of professional judgment in making those decisions. I mean, I, from, our, from a scrutiny perspective, I think what we would be considering this within the context of, we've moved a long way from a position in which um, partner agencies are now uh, you know, very much having ownership of the need to both pr protect and promote children's well-being and, and recognising the role they have in that, and we would not wish momentum to be lost in that, uh, in how far that, that work has come, and we would be able to identify what the levers are when we're out inspecting in terms of what promotes positive early intervention as well as what some of the barriers are. Okay, thank you.
Good to see you. Come on, David. Um, likewise, fully supportive of getting it right for every child and the in-person service and think that it's a real opportunity to bring a bit more consistency and practice across the country in terms of legislation. Um, just now, we have done a lot of work internally in terms of standards of information management, taking the, the rights of the child as part of that assessment process um, and actually really justifying and recording a rationale for sharing information, no matter what agency it's with. But actually, what we have just now across the country is, is a bit of a patchwork quilt in terms of where that information then goes. So I think it's a huge opportunity in terms of even going back to, to Christy and the opportunity for us to deliver, deliver on the prevention agenda and get much better at picking up on the early warning signs. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Ross. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, DC, I come in particularly interested in how this affects Police Scotland, given your relatively unique position within it. One of the objectives of Name Person is to improve consistency around information sharing. And as now that you're a, a national force, I was wondering what your officers' experience is of consistency when it comes to your relationship with social work, with schools across the local authorities. I think that's been a challenge. Um, in house, we've been able to to drive consistent practice in terms of how we're managing information, how we're assessing that information and how we're sharing that information. And that's not sharing all information that we've really tightened up in terms of what's shared and who it's shared with. I think what the challenge is following the Supreme Court judgment is that it created a fair bit of uncertainty in terms of what could happen. Um, and there was different interpretations within the local partnerships of what that meant to them. So there was a bit of push and pull in terms of the local <coughs> partnerships, in terms of the, their expectations of us, in terms of when we would share and uh, when we wouldn't share. And actually, we've just we've managed to work through a lot of that. But I think the legislation would probably bring a bit more clarity around about the roles and responsibilities and functions of the name person service, and actually give us. Um, it would probably declutter the landscape a bit for us and, and, and help us ensure that uh, children don't fall between the gaps. Thanks. And how much of a change to your current practice would it mean once fully implemented? In some of your uh, previous submissions to I think it was Finance and Constitution Committee indicated, particularly around the uh, Concern Hub, that you're essentially operating in line with the provisions in the, in the proposed bill. Yeah, I think we're fairly comfortable in terms of a continuous improvement journey. Um, that there, I've heard examples of uh, people quoting where things have um, maybe not been dealt with properly. Hopefully they're isolated and they're not a, a massive issue. I think that the, the challenge for us in terms of, yeah, we've trained our Concern Hub staff. We really have started to embed the standards of information management and information sharing. But the challenge for us is in terms of our operational practice. Um, and I think there's further training to be done uh, with our operational officers because we deal with a quite a high volume of child concerns on a weekly basis. And actually, the journey of identifying well-being concerns, recording the well-being concerns, articulating them to children and families all starts sometimes in a household at 3 o'clock in the morning. So we need to make sure that our officers actually get that right um, at first point of contact. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in Police Scotland's uh, submission to the Finance Committee, um, just to pick up on the point actually you've just raised, there were concerns about resourcing of this. Could you first of all tell us, DCI Conway, uh, how much time of the uh, officers' training would be spent on uh, information sharing and knowing uh, what is right and what is not right in terms of what they have to do? The uh, Police Scotland have uh, put significant investment in my project. It's been, this has been one of the work streams for the past three years or so. Um, so it's been a bit of a journey in terms of continuous improvement. Um, what I would say is we're still working through what potentially the implications of GDPR are, what the implications of this bill and the code of practice are. Um, we don't have a definitive in terms of what that training would look like in terms of our operational officers. There's some train of thought that we may be able to address it through e-training, but actually we may need to address it through face-to-face -face training. But actually, a big focus will be on standards and information. Um, so um, it's really difficult to give in terms of resource commitment and time. Um, but what I would say, we, we did flag up in the reply to the financial memorandum that we felt that 
the government should recognise that there has been no account taken of Police Scotland training requirements. Um, but what I would say to caveat that is I don't think it's insurmountable. And I think yeah, even if we didn't have this bill here, um, I think we would still be having to uh, train our officers in terms of standards of GDPR and explicit consent. I, I'm sure. Could you tell us uh, how much money has been spent on uh, this training already? It's difficult to put. It, it, the project I'm involved in, the Risk and Concern project, has been pretty wide-ranging. There's been three work streams. Um, we, we've been largely working on concern hub improvement. We've been working on uh, the, the CYP Act and Bill, and we have um, also had the Vulnerable Persons Database. So we've had a project team that have been working in that for probably about three years. Really difficult to put a cost in, uh, against that in terms of stripping that out and what was spent where. Um, in general terms, the, the work streams have all ran alongside each other. And actually, from a police perspective, I think we're in a much better place now than what we were three years ago. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. I'm just interested in the fact that obviously you've made quite a strong complaint to the Finance Committee that you don't feel the resourcing behind this is adequate. And therefore, to make that judgment, you must have some idea of what it is that is required in yeah. order to make it adequate. Could, could you expand a little bit on what kind of money you think does have to go into this training? I don't necessarily think the complaint uh, from the submission was in relation to resourcing in general. It was just for a recognition that there will need to be some level of resource committed to developing training packages and delivering the training packages. So what I'm saying is I don't think that that will cause us a huge issue we thought that it would be worth flagging to the government that um, that hadn't been picked up in terms of the financial provision for the rollout of the bill. But what I'm saying is, in terms of our project taking things forward, I think that um, the cost and resources could probably subsume, be subsumed in, in amongst the other work that we're doing just now. Uh, well, having said that, though, I, I think there was comment made that you were a bit surprised uh, that the budget was given only for one year beyond implementation. And uh, you rightly made the point, or rightly in my view, made the point that there will be ongoing training for new officers. Um, have the police done any uh, estimate of what that uh, cost would be? We don't have any costs against that. If it was an e-based training package, clearly it would be much more straightforward to actually deliver that training. If it's going to be face-to-face -face training, there's probably more implications in terms of delivery and costs and resources. So we're actually still at the stage of considering what we actually need. It's not totally clear what GDPR is going to look like. Um, we don't actually know in general terms. We will be involved in the redrafting of the Code of Practice. So it's very much a work in progress. Um, it's really difficult at this time to actually see what that looks like in the future. But DCI Conway, once you do know these details, uh, surely it would be practical and sensible to make a recommendation about how much money is required in order for you to do your job properly. Because that's the implication of what's already been said to the Finance Committee. That's a fair point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gillian? Yeah, I actually want to pick up on something you just said there. <clears throat> DCI Conway, you, uh, you already said that you will be involved in the redrafting of the Code of Practice. It gives me an opportunity to ask what you you feel from speaking to the people in your organisations, what you feel should be in that Code of Practice and how that should look. I think in the, the written submission back, um, <clears throat> we, we expressed some concerns with the heavy weighting towards consent. And I know that there are strong viewpoints on consent. Um, I am not, the first thing I'll caveat this with is I'm not an, an expert in information management, I'm not a lawyer, but um, I've spent quite a lot of time over the last year and a half looking at uh, standards information management, data protection act, schedules two and three, and the point that we made back was that in terms of what's coming for, for GDPR in terms of explicit consent, um, we find it really difficult in an operation set, operational setting to apply that explicit consent. So we felt that the Code of Practice in its current illustrative draft had too much weighting on consent. And actually there was other uh, legal basis for, for police and partners to share information. And we actually do that successfully just now. So we would, we would like more clarity in terms of I think it's really important that we take a rights-based approach to, to children and young people. Um, but if, if I have officers standing at three o'clock in the morning in a really challenging situation, 
the standards of explicit consent are going to be really difficult to obtain at that time um, because quite often the officers actually don't know what's going to come after we join it up with the chronology within the concern hub assessment process. So actually, how can we tell them where we are going to share their information? Because the officers don't know. So, uh, so uh, in terms of the redrafting of that code, I, I think there needs to be more clarity. Um, I, I think there is dangers in going for an uh, exclusively consent-based model. I, I think that will cause real difficulties for the police and probably other emergency services. I think that it will pro probably um, cause us to actually hold information that otherwise could have been shared in terms of the current law. Um, so I would like to work through that with the government. Uh, I'm fully <coughs> supportive. I'm quite comfortable that we can support um, the government to redraft that code to be more reflective of the current law. And I'm not dismissing uh, children's rights uh, and the right for... Uh, for Part of our training will always be to seek the, the views of children and young people. Um, but actually, if we ask a, a child or young person in a house at two o'clock in the morning, if they give us their consent to share their information, and then later on at part of the assessment, they say no. And then at our assessment stage, we actually believe we've got a legal basis to share information. We've got a bit of tension there in terms of what they said and what actually our duty is in terms of our statutory duties. So we're really comfortable with seeking views and actually taking the views of the child or the young person or the parent or the guardian into account as part of that assessment process. But actually, I think there's some dangers in going for a practice model that could actually see child concerns being stockpiled and actually is not getting the right information to the right people at the right time. So that's just um, that's from a police perspective we really have difficulties and i think the ico has represented that um, where public bodies will find it really difficult to make these standards um, so if we are not excluding consent there will be circumstances where we will seek consent to share information however we will probably look for another legal basis to share the information rather than solely exclusively relying on consent. And that's the bit that we just need to work through in the code of practice. That's really helpful, thanks. I wonder if anyone else wants to come in around. Just come in so it'd be helpful for him to come in at this point and then the rest yeah. of them can answer it. I, I hear what you say, uh, DCI Comrade, around consent in another sort of test. I just wondered what you think that test looks like um, if you if you know if we're talking about redrafting the illustrative code yeah do you have a suggestion for I, I think, us of, of, of where that threshold would lie yeah i think in terms of the current legislation um in terms of schedules two and three and i, and I don't want to become technical here but um there is uh, other conditions for processing information within schedules two and three that still allow us to satisfy the law consent is only one of, of the conditions for processing um, so I think it's really important if we're looking for a practice model that's actually more consistent, focused on prevention, a shift towards family support rather than crisis responses, then I think we need to actually use the current law in, in, it, in its format, still be compliant with data protection, still be compliant with human rights, really tighten up on actually necessity, proportionality, justification, and actually only sharing relevant information with the right people. Um, and that's not a blanket sharing of information. But in terms of our statutory duties under the Police and Fire Reform Act, um, in terms of our core purpose to improve the safety and well-being of people in places and communities, and some of the core functions of a police constable in terms of prevention, detection of crime, these are ways that we can look to share information and justify the sharing of that information to act in the best interests of a child. But we also can look at the receiving organisation in terms of their core functions and roles and responsibilities and actually make an assessment on whether they have a core function and a role and responsibility to help that child or young person. So I think that's really important in terms of the current law allows us to do that. Um, there may be isolated cases that have been highlighted in terms of where we've got it wrong. I would like to think that a lot of that will be addressed through training. Um, and actually, this is a nothing standing still. There's a lot of things happening. There's continuous improvement across the board. And, and actually, um, I just think the opportunities, uh, the opportunities there to still act within the Data Protection Act and Human Rights Act without going for a solely consent-based model. 
Okay, no, that, that's, that's uh, helpful and interesting. What worries me, I mean, I'm looking at uh, paragraph 107 uh, of the Supreme Court just, uh, judgment where they're talking uh, towards the end of it about a compelling justification for sharing that information. And I cannot understand the argument you're making within the context of the police, but I appreciate for other people who might have to interact with this legislation who maybe don't have the background experience of a police constable, it'll be quite difficult to figure out what a compelling justification means in the individual circumstances. Do you, do you accept that? I, I take your point. Um, my understanding is that the code of practice, when it's redrafted, will be the high-level document in terms of um, setting out um, the kind of standards. But actually, my understanding is the intention is that each of the organisations will actually develop their own practice guidance that will sit under that code of practice. That so it can't be rigid, there's got to be a bit of flexibility and I accept that there will be circumstances in, in a controlled environment um, where consent is the appropriate route. Um, I just think that we can't forget about some of the statutory duties that the police and others have in terms of sharing information right now. And, and actually there's a tension there because um, if we look at the Children's Hearing Act and, and, and our duty to share information with the Children's Reporter Administration, on one hand, we could be dealing with a child youth offender and actually have a statutory duty to share that information, but at the same time asking consent to share their information with the named person service. And, and actually, what we're trying to do is actually make this practical so that we, we won't ignore the rights of children and young people but actually we'll take that into consideration as part of the assessment process to see whether we can lawfully share information. Uh, Ms Farr and then Ms Tate. Thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to come in on a couple of matters. Um, DCI Conway's covered very well, I think, the, the situation that the police are in, but there are a number of other service providers who will be sharing information about children and young people. Um, we believe that um, the basis of information sharing should be consent in the vast majority of cases, that, that sharing without consent should be exceptional. And I think DCI Conway's given some of those examples, and particularly the, the situation of a child at 3 a.m. Is, is very unlikely to be able to give consent um, in, in that, that situation. Um, but in the majority of cases with, with service, service providers who are dealing with children on a day-to-day -day basis and children that they know, for example, um, the NHS uh, and within local authorities and schools and in social work, um, we believe that the, these organisations should be able to provide an um, environment in which in, in a relationship with that child or young person and, and their family in which consent can be freely given um, that, and explicit consent can be obtained. Um, in the case of uh, the NHS, they do this routinely with children, young people and their families in respect of medical care, so it's not a new concept. Um, that, um, but to do so, and then coming on to the, the, you asked questions regarding the code of practice and other guidance, and we feel that um, there's been some evidence in earlier sessions, um, I think, given to you, where uh, there continues to be uh, a lack of clarity, and DCI Conway's also mentioned um, different practices between different local authorities and different interpretations uh, at present. Um, as a result, I think we feel, feel it's very important that um, the Code of Practice and Other Guidance um, puts consent at the heart, makes it clear that uh, children's rights approach should be taken and children have a right, um, Article 19 of the United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child, um, that uh, the state shall protect them, take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social, educational measures to protect the child from physical or mental violence, injury or abuse, neglect or negligent treatment. Um, and that's the, the right under which children's rights to privacy can be overridden and that information can be shared when they are at risk of, of significant harm. Um, the code of practice needs to be really clear. It needs to be understandable for um, practitioners working at all levels and bearing in mind that, that people sharing consent are not going to necessarily be senior management. Um, it needs to be uh, in language that's understood also by parents um, and by, by young people. Um, because there's a, a need to build um, confidence in, in the arrangements that are happening under the Children and Young People Act 2014 um, and to, to clarify exactly what's happened, exactly what will be shared and, and when and under what circumstances it will be done um, under child protection grounds. Um, the Information of commissions, of commission's Office have produced guidance in recent years that, that is easy to understand, on, that is still statutory guidance, and we don't feel it's an insurmountable problem to produce 
a code of practice that meets can, these requirements. Can I ask, Ms. Farr, then, I mean, mm -hmm. and this goes back to the point that, that, that uh, Gillian mm -hmm. Martin was asked, are you going to get the opportunity to feed in? So um, the points that you're making to us, will you have the opportunity to feed them into as, the government, uh, or have you already done so? Um, we continue to. We met with government last week to discuss it. Um, we'll continue to, to play the role that Parliament set us up to, to, yeah, 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 to provide, yeah, exactly. which is um, to make sure the children's rights are at the heart of the process, um, and we'll continue to feed that into government. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to let the, the other two speakers. Judith, thank you. From a scrutiny perspective, what we see is where um, the performance of community planning partnerships is strong and positive, um, practitioners are very reliant on good, clear guidance. Um, and I think that guidance and legislation are essential, uh, parts of the, the whole kind of network and framework of how um, children's needs can be, uh, can be best met. I think what underpins that is the presence of strong, respectful, cooperative relationships between partners, and I think that will that will also support um, kind of uh, positive and uh, an appropriate information sharing. What we see is that uh, training is incredibly important, but multi-agency training will have a really positive impact, and not just once, but revisited. Practitioners need opportunities to come together to tease out those difficult situations. The ones that are clear are clear and people know what to do and they take action. I think the ownership of the need to protect children means that that's very well understood now across services. But the ones that sit below that threshold, which are tricky, require good relationships to help tease that out, supported by good guidance to do that, and supported by quality assurance arrangements within services that help and managers and leaders to look back and say, have we got that right? What can we learn about how can we improve that? So guidance legislation is one aspect of being able to um, meet children's needs at an early point appropriately would be from our inspection findings. <coughs> Ms Murphy. In relation to um, the underlying principles of the Code of Practice, I, I agree with most of what's been said. Um, it should be person-centred. Um, and it should take the young people's needs into consideration from the absolute out so, out, outset. In terms of the college's point of view, we work extensively um, with authorities and local partners to ensure that those young people's needs are, are, are upheld as best as possible. But the code of practice also needs to have a, a, a practical element to it so that staff, whatever organisation they represent, can interpret it, understand it and apply it with a reasonable level of consistency. But if those pr principles are about the young person being at the centre, then I feel um, that's got a better chance of being the outcome. It needs to be a practical document. It needs to be a document that people can understand and use within their day-to-day -day operational teaching and learning organisation. Um, and it ultimately needs to represent the needs of young people. Um, and I, I, would, I would strongly urge that, that that's kept at the forefront. OK, uh, Gillian started this off, so I'll, I'll go back to her and then Joanne wants to come in. Yeah, so, so do, do you agree? I mean, what I'm getting from you, that there's maybe an opportunity here to improve information sharing. You, may, that you mentioned a patchwork situation as it stands at the moment. But also, from what you're saying as well, it sounds to me that there's also an, an opportunity to do training jointly between people so that there's a lot greater understanding as to what each type of organisation faces. And how you, um, would, would that be off the mark? You, you're all nodding, so... Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. information will be, will be happening on a joint basis yeah. as part of GERFIC implementation. So across the, the country, in our joint inspections, we would see evidence there have been opportunities for joint training. What we don't see as often is that, that partners are able to come back together, staff are come back together routinely and regularly to revisit that training. Now that they have become more familiar with it mm -hmm. and with guidance, what is it like to put that guidance into operation? How do we um, kind of overcome some of the kind of the sticky points in that and, and, and areas that people are less clear about? So, so ongoing training, I think, and opportunities to come together yeah. are, are, are really important. So can I ask, sorry, sorry to butt in, but can I ask, in terms of the well-being information that's shared, and obviously the Concern Hub, you've been working on this, sharing well-being information. And that's, that, that word seems to be is right in the middle of this, this, this whole, whole thing. How is that done and how do you see that being done as a result of the, the, the bill? How would that change? It, it won't. It, it, the standards we're applying to the information within the police just now won't necessarily change other than our, our obviously operational officer practice. Um, what we'll probably find more consistency in, in terms of the bill and the code of practice, is the routing of that information and where it goes. 
And actually, to pick up on your last point, in terms of defining the roles and responsibilities and actually um, making it clearer where everybody fits into the bigger picture round about getting it right for every child, I think it's a good opportunity. Um, traditionally, a lot of this information has went to social work. And actually, social work, um, it, it, there's, a, there's now an opportunity to actually look at what social work's role is in all of this, um, what the main person's role is, what the third sector's role is. Um, and actually, I think there would be great opportunities through joint training to actually get that better understanding of each other's roles and responsibilities. So the information is actually going to the person who really needs it yeah. the most, yeah. rather than right. Sorry, you wanted to come in. Uh, just to concur, um, within the college context, um, we work with some of the most vulnerable and excluded young people um, in the most areas of deprivation and poverty, and with that comes a whole range of issues. Um, I can't do my job in isolation. I have to work in partnership with a range of organisations. It's pretty implicit in, pr in practice in the faculty that I work for and the team that I support to do so. And the staff should be encouraged to raise concerns and raise concerns on a, a regular basis, um, regardless if they, they become full-blown safeguarding issues and the code of practice this needs to give staff the opportunity to recognise that they feel they can raise concerns. Um, and the collegiate partnership working is absolutely imperative to moving this forward successfully. We can't exist in isolation anymore. Yeah, um, a specific point, first of all, to uh, Megan Farr. I think you said that there shouldn't be sharing of information at the test would be unless there's a significant risk of harm. And I wonder how you think that sits with a view that what we need is early intervention. You seem to be suggesting don't share information until effectively there's a crisis. And actually then there's a problem because you haven't done the things you could have done to prevent the crisis in the first place. Our view from, from a human rights perspective is that information shouldn't be cared, shared without consent um, below the, the child protection threshold. Um, but and, so, and at what age would the consent be given by the child and not their carer? Um, the UNCRC, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, the committee's general comment 12, which deals with the issue of, of children's right to have their views taken into account, um, states that children should be as, um, presumed to have capacity uh, unless they're assessed otherwise. Um, in terms of the current data protection legislation in Scotland, um, an age of 12 is set at the ages at which the majority of children um, will have the capacity to consent to information sharing. Um, so and in terms of early intervention with a family, I mean, just to, yep. to be devil's advocate, there's a young, there's a, a young person under 12 that you have concerns about. Yep. I think this is... And, this is you want, and, and you need to work early. Yep. There's not a crisis, but you can see there's a problem coming. I mean, as a school teacher, I would have seen maybe a deteriorating situation myself. Yeah. You're, I think saying, you're saying that the, the, adult and that the adult responsible for the young person could withhold consent because there wasn't um, a significant risk of harm. That's the current situation, and, and, um, and we feel that, that there isn't compelling evidence that, that children's rights under um, Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights uh, and their rights under the United Nations Rights of the Child um, should be breached. Um, but their right to a secure, yeah. and family, that's a, a secure yeah. family situation, their ability to learn, and that's, that the consent can be withheld by if, if the I, carer. If I could I'm, answer... I, want, I want to be clear. We talk about somebody who's under 12, where there are concerns, and early intervention strategies, you would want to come in early and try and support. But you would say that well, what, the issue what, of consent... Is that the higher test? What we would say is that in under getting it right for every child and the approach which should be happening with children and families already is that um, families and should be working, uh, well, service delivery organisations at schools, the health service should be working in um, partnerships. We've talked a bit about partnership already. The partnership should include a partnership with parents and their children. Mm -hmm. And there should, shouldn't be a situation where there isn't an, a relationship built up with that family already. Do you think there's ever a situation where there's the, the rights of the child and the rights of the carer are different then? There are. And therefore, uh, in those circumstances, the exercise of consent by the carer may have an impact on the young person, but you, you would still apply the same test? If on the balance of, of, of the rights of child's rights to be um, protected, um, outweigh the, the parents' right to exercise Article 8 of the ECHR on behalf of their child if the child is below 12. Um, on that basis, 
um, we would we would say if the right to be protected would take precedence, and in that case, the information could be shared. That's the current, effectively, it's expressed in human rights language, but that's the current situation with regard to child protection. But the more, the more kind of the policy around early intervention clearly comes up again. So can I ask maybe just one last yeah, yeah. question? This is a theme that has come up in other evidence sessions, that the duty that's now going to apply may involve defensive practice by those in, involved in making decisions around information. If you've got a duty to share, mm -hmm. that's pretty straightforward. If you've got a duty to consider to share, and there is some question about what you would have to evidence you to give to show that you've done that, it may lead in certain circumstances to people feeling, to be on the safe side, I'm not going to pursue this. Is this a concern that anybody in the panel has? Um, I think that's a con sorry. I think that's a concern we do have um, in in terms of that we have heard in examples with in, with issues which are child protection issues aren't shared, but also examples where. Um, people don't share with their line management. Now, that isn't information terms in share of data protection. That's how organisations operate. For example, a classroom assistant not informing the line manager of a concern, um, that would be normal practice for, uh, and is, is, isn't covered as processing under the data protection legislation. Just in relation to um, the college approach, I'd mentioned in one of my earlier contributions that, that, that we offer training on safeguard and corporate parent to frontline teaching staff, reception-based staff, support staff, and take a holistic approach to understanding the, the underlying principles of safeguarding. And we encourage conversation and we encourage information sharing as best as possible. And we try and ensure that staff are given appropriate CPD so that they have an understanding of their role, the legislation and the jurisdictions around it accordingly to protect both them and the young people who are attending um, our college campuses. And I think the principles are pretty clear. But do you think that the new approach, as a consequence of the role in the Supreme Court, makes it less, makes, make, would make practitioner more cautious than they would have been with the, the legislation as was before? I think with the application of a good code of practice and the application of good training, it, it, it won't. Um, I would say we probably came from a place many years ago where we only shared to a child protection threshold. And then we come through that journey where um, the ICO guidance from 2013, we started to believe that we were in good grounds to actually actively share wellbeing information regarding children. And actually what's happened following the Supreme Court judgment is that we have really tightened up in terms of individual rights. We've really tightened up in terms of the information that's been shared. But I wouldn't say that that's defensive practice. That's actually balancing the rights of individuals with actually the need to act in the best interests of children. So I'm fairly comfortable from a police perspective that there shouldn't be defensive practice, but actually there is improved practice in terms of how we're dealing with the information regarding children and young people. I would agree. I think that um, we've come a long way in terms of the ownership of, uh, of partner agencies and understanding their responsibilities to look after children's wellbeing and promote that. We see from our in, uh, scrutiny evidence that where wellbeing concerns have been acted upon, that for the majority of children will also improve their safety further down the line. So the decision to share information, coming to those conclusions for, uh, for practitioners is, is, a, is a highly complex one. They're taking into account a whole set of variables, what they know about the child, the family, the child's normal presentation, um, uh, you know, child development, the impact of, of, of adverse events on children. So a code of practice really does need to support professional judgment in coming to that conclusion. But I would argue that um, although I think since the Supreme Court judgment there has been potentially a dip in confidence of uh, people undertaking the role of named persons uh, in terms of knowing what they should be doing, and I would not wish any momentum to be further lost, um, that actually the commitment to get that right and do that at the right time in the right circumstances is, is strongly held across the country. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Colin and Daniel. Um, Julian Rankin uh, raised the question of well-being. Is there, is, there a, is there a common concept of well-being? Do you have the same? Does everybody have the same understanding of what well-being means? Because it's quite an important, uh, quite an important thing. I think that um, I think the well-being indicators have been a very helpful framework for practitioners. 
uh, we, uh, across the joint inspection programme, have seen the evolution, I suppose, of, of confidence um, from our practitioners in understanding the, the holistic needs of, 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 of children. There will inevitably be some differences in an interpretation of responsible and respected, and there are differences in terms of what that means in terms of different ch children's ages. But the more that practitioners come together to debate that and discuss that and, and consider what their role is in promoting children's well-being, then the, the further down the road of having a shared understanding of language of what well-being, positive well-being means. Um, I would support that. Um, I would say that probably the vast majority of um, the well-being concerns dealt with by the police um, are largely in relation to safety and health. Um, uh, and um, the indicators are, are, are really good for us uh, in terms of making that assessment of, of need in terms of where the information, if we have the legal basis to do so, where we would share that. I would concur. I think um, from a college perspective, our understanding of the principles of wellbeing are very consistent. They're also shared with uh, the work we do with secondary schools. So there's seamless transition from young people who come from secondary schools uh, to further education and that, that's ever growing. Uh, and we share a common understanding of wellbeing and we apply the Shinari principles accordingly. So I'm pretty confident that, yeah, we are consistent in our approach to the, to the standards of wellbeing. Yeah, what, what we see is that, that there's a good understanding across different sectors and that those, uh, the, particularly the Shinari framework is used um, to provide a holistic assess assessments of children some well-being um, and uh, that it's a, a good way of ensuring that children's rights are realised. Would I be correct in interpreting what you're saying is that there's a, there's a sort of a, a core of understanding of what well-being means with variations according to the disciplines that are using it to interpret it for the individual. That's probably a bit clumsy the way I've said it, but what I'm trying to get at is there's a little bit of flexibility in it according to how you're applying it, would that, would that be fair? Okay, well, I think we recognise that we represent different organisations, so we will see, um, I don't see children, I work with young people, so we'll see young people in an educational context, so the indicators for them will be seen in a classroom environment, so my staff can pick up on any kind of deterioration or issues in a classroom environment. So I think there are nuances or differences, but I think the principles are applied consistently. What it's been, what's been helpful is that in the past, when we've been reviewing um, kind of plans for individual children as part of an inspection, um, it may well be that, that education staff have been focusing on, on their role in, in supporting achievement. I think as, as um, confidence with the wellbeing indicators has grown, what we see is that uh, different professionals recognise the whole range of contributions they can make uh, across the wellbeing indicators so that children's plans will be recognising the teachers and the school's contribution to respected and responsible as well as to healthy and active. Um, so it's, it's, it, it has broadened, I think, the understanding of how professionals can contribute to wellbeing. So again, I'm interpreting a little bit here, but would I be correct in saying that too rigid a definition of wellbeing if, if, for example, it, it, it was in the bill or whatever, describing well-being might actually be counterproductive, that that little bit of flexibility according to the different disciplines is perhaps the right way it should be. I would agree with that. Um, in terms of a rigid definition, um, could actually be applied in black and white, and, and actually we, we could have practitioners making decisions that they don't fit the definition. Um, I think the indicators allow enough flexibility, bearing in mind that every concern regarding a child should be judged in its own merits. They are only indicators, so it's part of a whole assessment process in terms of a wider chronology regarding that child or young person. And the changes that are coming um, in terms of GDPR and so on, would that, do you think, affect any of your interpretation of well-being? as a concept, or does the core still remain unchanged? Um, I don't think that it, I, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't think it's going to have any impact, um, impact in relation to consent, but uh, nothing I can think of in, in relation to the Shinari indicators. I agree, I don't think the principles should change because of the, the, the new re regulation. I think we should still operate from a, a, a position of wellbeing. Thank you very much, Daniel.
So <clears throat> what we are currently looking at is um, information sharing on the basis of, 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 of well-being. I think we've established that on the basis of welfare, information sharing already takes place, uh, uh, and that also, uh, to some extent, um, on, on well-being too, on the basis of, ex of existing law. So what I'm interested in, what, what this current legislation that we're considering, how it changes things. So I was just wondering if, especially Judith Tate and Maggie Murphy, if, if you could just explain what information you currently share in terms of, of well-being um, and on, on what basis? Could you just bring that to life a little bit, maybe give some examples? Okay. Um, within the uh, regulatory uh, responsibilities, we, when we're inspecting care services for children, mm -hmm. we will be discussing how well the service is recognising the well-being needs of the children they are mm -hmm. providing a service for. Mm -hmm. If we believe those if we believe there are um, concerns for the child's safety, then we will be directing the service to take action, but we may also refer directly if we believe that threshold of child protection has been met. Where it sits below that, our role will be to encourage and uh, uh, the, the provider to, to, to take appropriate action and to share information with the named person service. We, we do not share information directly with named person services ourselves. Okay. In our joint inspection programme, we will be reviewing records of vulnerable children. These are the children who are already have a lead professional for whom there is a multi-agency plan and therefore information has been shared um, kind of widely within the appropriate group of professionals for them already. From a college perspective and in particular from the areas that I've got responsibility for, the majority of young people who are know with me will be on a referral basis and the referral will come from school or social work. So from the outset, there's information coming from another organisation to me and there'll be key indicators and key pieces of information about wellbeing and associated factors within that, um, within that referral document. Um, within the college environment, a young person will also be in possession of an individual learning plan that they make a significant contribution to in terms of their learning targets, learning goals that they want to achieve throughout the year. And the staff who are part of that curricular area add um, relevant information into that individual learning plan. Uh, young people from school also come in with a wellbeing and assessment plan. So there's key indicators within that and we use the college experience to try and nurture them and develop them further. So those are just kind of two examples of where the college would work in partnership and share information accordingly. So, so can I ask, would, and, and this is for the whole panel, I mean, would that sort of information which falls below the children, uh, the, the child protection criterion tests ever be shared without consent? And, and therefore, does, does this bill actually really change the nature of what information you know, can be shared and would be shared? I would say the, what the bill uh, would probably strengthen from my perspective is actually bringing statutory functions for the named person service, which is actually part of the assessment process under data protection for sharing information. So actually defining what the functions and roles and responsibilities of a named person service are will actually bring more consistency in the, the models across the country. So I think there's a positive. I, I, and I mentioned the patchwork um, quilt earlier. That is the current position just now. I think what the bill brings in terms of bringing the name person service on, onto a, a statutory footing and greater clarification around the information sharing arrangements will bring greater consistency in practice across the country and probably reduce inequalities in service provision. I mean, to be fair, the bill itself, I mean, that, that clarity was really restricted to, to that, the duty to consider. Do you think that's sufficient? I think it is in terms of the current law and as underpinned by the code of practice. We need to get the code of practice right, and I think that's been a common theme today. Yeah. Um, so... The bill, the code of practice, bringing the name person service on a statutory footing will actually declutter the landscape for me in terms of the sharing of, of information and provide greater clarity. I think that clarity is absolutely right. So I'd, I'd just like to address my last question to Megan Farr specifically on that basis. In your uh, written submission, um, if I could just quote from it, that you say that you're concerned that the threshold for sharing information, uh, for sort of sharing data proposed by the CYP Act uh, had been lowered to a point where there was a risk of the rights of the child, uh, the child's right to privacy might be violated, and that the current bill does not add clarity to this. 
Could you just maybe ex expand on this and expand on your concerns about clarity and, and, and what <coughs> changes would you think need, would need to be made to be able to, to give that clarity? Um, I think that um, what our concern was was that there wasn't clarity previously about whether or not, and it's back to the question about whether there are concerns about <coughs> well-being, um, our view is that that should be done on the basis of consent, and that is actually in line with how getting it right for every child should work. Um, we'd also be concerned at this point if the Parts 4 and 5 of the 2014 Act continued to be delayed, because those are very important. The name person service is an important way that children's rights will be realised in Scotland. Um, but um, the, the issue around thresholds and whether there was a threshold created that was lower than um, the, the child protection threshold, um, particularly if it was based around a risk of harm to well-being, or at, at one point there was a phrase around the, a risk of being on a pathway um, mm -hmm. to, to harm, um, that, that wasn't clear. Uh, I'm not sure the duty to consider, which doesn't change the threshold, it merely says that you need to think about whether it meets the threshold, um, adds anything, because that should be what is already happening, that's good child protection practice in service delivery organisations. Um, practitioners are trained in child protection regularly and trained to be aware of what is likely to be a child protection concern. Um, now, it may be that the child protection threshold needs to be adjusted, but our concern with the 2014 Act was that it was considerably, potential to be interpreted as considerably lower. So, so just finally on those points, I mean, it, what strikes me is that there are some key points of principle around information sharing, mm -hmm. for, which frankly are, are not on the face of the bill, they're in the code of practice, pr pr principally around consent and mm -hmm. the rights of the child. Do you think those should be put on the face of the bill? And given the importance of the code of practice, do you think it, it should have a, a, a greater level of scrutiny rather than essentially being a, in the gift of ministers? Um, on the code of practice, I think it is really important that um, it, it receives scrutiny um, to make sure that it is um, able to be understood by practitioners, by um, older young people, like not all children will be able to understand it, um, by families, um, by, understood by everyone. Um, so I think it does need to be scrutiny. I think it's going to be the most important aspect of this, this bill is putting um, a clear code of practice and clear guidance in the hands of practitioners who are sharing information so that everyone can have confidence that information is being shared appropriately. So can I just ask, do you think rights and, 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 and consent should be on the face of the bill? That was the other part of the question. Um, in, in line with, with the government's commitment to, to taking a human rights base, yes, hum, a human rights based approach should be taken. Okay, much clear. Thank you, panel. Unfortunately, I've got an, a question for DCI Conway. I'm sorry, we seem to have been uh, targeting at, at, at yourself. You had made mention of a concern hub, and I wonder for those of us who are unaware of what that is and how that functions, could you tell the committee what that is? Um, sorry, I should have explained earlier. Um, in terms of uh, the vast majority of concerns we deal with with regards to members of the public, um, aren't protection threshold concerns. The vast majority of them are wellbeing concerns. So there is a significant amount of information there that we need to better understand. Um, so we put concern hubs in place when we moved to Police Scotland. So every division has a concern hub. There is dedicated staff trained in standards and information management. But actually, it's not just all about the information management. It's actually picking up on the early warning signs. So we've got a strong evidence base going back many years where these repeat concerns come up regarding children and we actually don't pick up on them. So the police don't pick up on them, the partners don't pick up on them. So the hubs and the staff within the hubs, very much yes, standards of information management, respecting individuals' rights and balancing them. We act in the best interests of a child or an adult. However, um, they're also looking at to, to deliver on early intervention and prevention. So they're actually looking to deliver on getting it right for every child. So the, the, the advantage in terms of um, us starting to record chronologies regarding children, um, we don't have the information in a whole load of different places that is not visible. We have it in one place and it helps us make a better assessment on um, what services may best support or intervene um, rather than waiting to the kind of crisis responses or the protection thresholds that traditionally it's, it's went wrong and it's far too late. So 
it's a kind of focus on Christy trying to bring um, a greater focus on early intervention prevention and, and, a, and a bit of information management and standards in relation to the Data Protection Act. So these are there's 13 of the hubs across the 13 divisions across the country, um, and that's their daily role in, in terms of um, triaging the, the information in the morning, researching it, assessing it, and then taking a decision on whether to share it. And actually, when they do take a decision on sharing it, we put a strong emphasis on recording the rationale so that there's an auditable record of why something's went somewhere. So that's that's a real tightening up in practice in terms of where we've previously been. And in, in terms of this bill, then, do you think that this will, you know, will be advantageous to the concern hub? Is this going to make things easier for Police Scotland in terms of that information sharing and being being able to uh, direct that information to the correct person? Yeah, I think that's the bit. Um, I don't think it'll have a significant impact on the daily operation of the hub, but it will have an impact on where the information is rooted. And I, and I very much think that the statutory name person service will only be a piece of the jigsaw. So not all of our information regarding children will be going to the name person service. We'll be looking at other routes and some of them will be done with consent, particularly when we look at the third sector organisations that can uh, have got really strong services to support children. Thank you. Ruth? Um, good morning. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about um, data protection. And this morning, I think we've probably heard that actually your evidence isn't is that there's already information sharing going on, and it's it's you know it's working well for you. We have um, taken evidence previously that people are concerned about information sharing. So I suppose I'd like to know how much of the sort of challenge, if there are any challenges or concerns in your organisations, are around um, GDPR rather than the specifics of this bill, because obviously that's on the horizon and has an implication. From the college's perspective, we're slightly less concerned about GTP, GDPR. Um, I think we're comfortable with the, the various documents and the uh, the information that we have in a college environment and that we are also comfortable that we share the right information at the right time with the right people. And I think the focus on the Children and Young Persons Bill is the learner-centred approach to things and the, the young person being at the centre. So I think GTPR will be a little later for us, but I don't think it's seen as an impediment in any way. Um, I would say that GDPR is more of a concern to the police re regarding uh, explicit consent and actually how that will operate in operational practice, how we will actually inform people of their rights, how we will actually have an auditable record of that consent and how we're going to do that in really challenging circumstances. So I'm probably more concerned about GDPR than I am about this bill. Okay. I think we will continue to be interested in how well partners that we're inspecting are sharing information and using, uh, acting within um, uh, their, own, their own policy and guidance. So we'll be interested to see how providers are interpreting that as well as considering the impact for ourselves. Um, we'll continue to look at GDPR in terms of children's rights. Um, as an organisation, um, we uh, our provision of the service isn't dependent on whether or not young people give consent. So um, we will continue, our current practice will continue, which is that we only very exceptionally share information without consent. Yeah. Thank you. Oliver, do you want to come in? Can you make it brief? As brief as I can. I'd, oh, I'd, that's not good enough. Is it not good <laughs> enough? Sorry. Um, it's quite technical because I just want to refer to two bits of the Supreme Court judgment and then ask one further question just of uh, Megan Farr following on from her evidence uh, to. Uh, previous questions. At paragraph 79 of the Supreme Court judgment, it references the case of uh, Gillen uh, versus United Kingdom. And in uh, that judgment, it talks about who an instrument applies to uh, and the number and status to, who, uh, to those of whom it's addressed. And I think you touched briefly on it being uh, addressed to children 12 and above who might be looking to understand it. Uh, and that sort of links me on to paragraph 81, where, again, uh, in the judgment, they talk about sufficient foreseeability uh, to allow a person to regulate his or her conduct. And I just wonder whether the kind of flexibility uh, and indicators that, that come with Shinari and the kind of flexibility some other people are looking for 
uh, in uh, the, the the sort of information sharing rate, how how whether it's possible to have legal certainty uh, and retain that flexibility in a statutory form. I think there may be two questions there. One regarding the age at which children have capacity. Yeah. Um, we have existing legislation in Scotland from dating from 1991 about the age of legal capacity and um, the age at which children are, have the capacity to make decisions about medical. Um, decisions that happens to coincide also with the age at which children in Scotland have capacity around data protection and the Data Protection Act 1998, and that is 12, um, which is where that, that age of 12, it's the, the age that currently exists in legislation from a, um, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child um, would um, argue that, that um, children below the age of 12 could also have capacity, and in fact that, that's also the situation with both legal and medical capacity. Um, so those tests around capacity um, are fairly well established um, in, in Scots law in terms of, of the age at which children are able to make decisions. Sorry, the second part of your um, question was around Shinari indicators and wellbeing? Yeah, is, is, is whether they can be quantified uh, in a way that meets the Supreme Court judgment, uh, but that also retains that flexibility that, that practitioners are looking for? So the Supreme Court judgment um, talked about um, the information sharing that it may, in practice, result in a disproportionate interference with the Article 8 rights of children, young people and their parents. Um, in our evidence, we talked about a balance, and, and I've mentioned earlier the balance between the protection of children and, and their rights to privacy. Um, and um, that's going to be a decision that is made on an individual basis. Um, the important thing is to go back to the code of practice, which I think we've all agreed is, is a really vital part of the, the legislation, is the code of practice needs to be clear enough and the guidance company it needs to be clear enough to enable practitioners um, to make those, um, those judgments of, of, on balance, which rights need to be take uh, priority. Does it, sorry, does it not also need to be clear enough to allow children with capacity yep. to make a judgment about what they choose to share in order to yeah. regulate their own behaviour to have that foreseeability. Yeah. Our, our view is that, that the majority of um, service providers who are providing services to children on a daily basis, social work, the health service, um, third sector organisations working with children, should have an environment in which children can freely give explicit consent to share. DCI Conway talked about situations where the police aren't in that position. Um, but uh, from a human rights perspective, our view is that that, that should be possible for children with capacity. Um, um, and the analogy is that, that at the age of 12, Sorry, a child can really instruct a solicitor to bring an action in court um, under Scots law already. So that's yeah. not a new concept. Okay, no, that's fine. You also mentioned uh, that you'd met with the government to discuss uh, concerns around mm -hmm. the draft. Um, it was on a range of matters, but, but we did discuss that, and um, I reiterated what I've said today and what I said in our written evidence, what we, we said in our written evidence. And they seemed receptive to, to changes to that? Um, I think they took my comments uh, on board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, on that note, I'd like to thank the panel members for their time this morning and for answering all our questions. I'll suspend for a moment or two to allow the witnesses to leave before continuing on to the second panel. Thank you.
please, uh, and I now welcome the witnesses for our second panel. The ben Ferugia, Head of Development and Innovation, Centre for Excellence for Looked After Children in Scotland. Donna McEwen, Practice Development Advisor, Centre for Youth and Criminal Justice. And Theresa Medhurst, Director of Strategy and Innovation, Scottish Prison Services. Thank you for attending this morning. I should explain to the panel from the outset that you should indicate to me if you would like to respond to a question and I'll, I'll call you to, to speak. I will start off by asking the witnesses how you would expect to be involved in the development of the final code of practice and whether you would expect any substantive differences between the code issued under part four, named person, and the code issued under part five, the child's plan. Could the same document cover both requirements? Would anybody like to start? Thank you. Good morning and thank you very much for having us here today. Um, in respect to the first question, uh, we are a Scottish government funded part of the University of Strathclyde. Um, we, are, we were set up to support the Scottish government with its realisation of its objectives around looked after children and child protection and to support our partners across the sector in their own efforts as well. Um, so in that particular aspect, we would, we would hope and expect to have um, a expect to have a contribution to the work that the Scottish Government is now going to undertake in terms of the code of practice and revisions to statutory guidance around parts 4, 5 and, um, and 18. We're an organisation that operates um, across the whole multi-agency partnership that works with children, so we have, um, I think, a valuable perspective to bring there about what information sharing and more generally practice to support children looks like in a multi-agency context. And we're also across the whole country as well, which also brings something important in terms of picking up from the earlier panel, some of that patchwork element um, that we see across the country. So being able to bring that information to bear into the next stages in terms of the code of practice revision. Okay, uh, well, we can talk about the first aspect then and then go back to the second. Okay, um, just uh, please excuse me, I've got a bit of a sore throat, so if I am not speaking very clearly, I do apologise. Um, at the Centre for Youth and Criminal Justice, we're very similar to Celsius in that we're a Scottish government um, funded agency. However, um, we support practitioners and the development of um, supporting children and young people and their families involved in offending behaviour across the country. So we provide that support and about developing practice and understanding, particularly when new pieces of legislation are coming in. So we hear from um, practitioners on the ground um, and take that back up along with lived experience and also from the legislation aspect and try and support them to translate that into what happens in practice. We, um, I actually met with the Scottish Government last week in relation to the proposed um, bill and the code of practice. Um, and they are keen to be involved um, and um, use our supports and our links with practitioners um, and perhaps that lived experience link as well to inform the code of practice moving forward, um, which we think is important and crucial to our role in supporting um, the application of GERFEC um, and the development of GERFEC across the country. Thank you. Um, from the Scottish Prison Service perspective, we've worked very closely um, over the last few years in um, transforming practice within Pullman in particular, which is where um, the majority, by far the vast majority of 16 and 17 year olds would be located um, when they come into custody. Um, and we've developed um, a positive futures plan, which is based on the Shinari principles and again informed by both organisations who are represented here today. So we have moved towards um, the, the, um, the position with regards to both um, case conferencing and sharing information um, around the, the best practice principles um, that have been set out already. So for us, um, we have work very closely um, and we are continuing to work closely with Scottish Government um, in order to um, be part of and inform the Code of Practice revision going forward. Okay, thank you. And in regards to the second part of the question about uh, substantive differences between the Code issued under Part 4 and Part 5, can you see the same, uh, the same document cover both requirements? May I? I can. Um, yes, I believe the same document can cover both parts. I think there are distinctions between them. Um, I think that's particularly true of the populations of concern that Celsius works with and I think CYCJ um, and, of course, the Scottish Prison Service. But I think the same document can cover them, um, but not necessarily in the same chapter, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would agree that the same document could, but I think you'd have to be quite explicit around the part four 
um, um, around the clarity and the different parts of legislation and supporting practitioners um, who are applying this to understand what that means in relation to decisions um, and also for the triggering of a child's plan and how that fits with the questions that have been raised by the role of the named person and um, where people choose not to be involved with the named person as well. So I think those are aspects that have to be clarified within um, the Code of Practice. Speakers. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Liz. You wanted to come in? Yes, thank you. Convener, you know, just, just on that point, could I ask what uh, specific changes do you foresee in the rewritten code of practice that uh, is not there just now in the illustrative one? Okay, um, okay happy to take that. Um, I think um, in speaking with practitioners and actually prior to the Supreme Court judgment, um, working at the CYCG, we were actually involved um, in developing case examples in relation for the um, CYP Act um, coming into force last year, which obviously it did not, um, or these aspects did not. So I would say that within the Code of Practice, there really needs to be examples of um, well-being concerns and um, in relation to the different aspects of legislation, the DPA, Schedules 2 and 3, and also Human Rights Act, um, and make that clearly understandable for practitioners um, who are applying this, but also, as has been said this morning already, children and um, children, young people and their families as well. Um, so I think using examples would be um, very beneficial for workers to actually see it in, in process. Um, would, would you go beyond uh, the Shinari indices then in terms of defining well-being, given that we were told in the earlier panel that there are differences within different professions? Um, actually, when I heard that this morning, I, I thought that actually was quite relevant. Um, I'm a social worker to trade um, and um, other people, health professionals. So our understanding of well-being um, will have the overarching principles, but how we perhaps apply our professional knowledge and skills to that may um, have slight nuances. Um, so I think there does have to be some level of flexibility, because I think there is the concern that if you make that definition too rigid, that you rule out um, a, a universal, and that's what we're talking about with wellbeing concerns, we're looking for universal um, responses to prevent children and young people um, escalating into um, statutory services. Thank you, that's interesting you make that point. I mean, some previous witnesses have said the opposite, that they feel um, uneasy in uh, deciding when they should share information, when they shouldn't share information, because they're uncomfortable that the definition is not tight. Would you accept these concerns? Um, I can accept that perhaps other um, professional disciplines might feel like that. Uh, my experience as a social worker, um, you're having to understand the um, presentations, whether the wellbeing concerns or whether it's of a higher level of welfare concerns. And you have to filter that through your professional knowledge and understanding in relation to that individual child and the context for that child and what that might mean. Um, and then from there, should you be sharing that information? Um, so. I, as a professional social worker, um, perhaps we make those decisions on a more regular basis, um, dealing with perhaps more nuances than in other um, professionals that there's a perhaps a stricter or tighter criteria. So, so your advice would be to have different codes of practice in different professions to get over that problem? I think the same code of practice, but a flexibility in the definition of wellbeing. Okay, thank you. Thank you to the panel. And I'd like to pick up a little bit on, on um, what Liz Smith was, was talking about there. Um, from my professional background as a, as a, as a healthcare worker, um, I'm used to working with Shinari principles and, and the principles of wellbeing and working very closely with uh, social work and, and third sector organisations. And I think uh, within those professions, certainly there's, there's a good common understanding of well-being and, and Shinari principles, but obviously the, the panel work with much wider uh, professional groupings and, and other organisations. And I, I was wondering if the panel is able to comment on those other uh, those other professions. Are they do they see a difference in the interpretation of well-being and Shinari, and, and 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 how do they see that working to with other or with other professions in terms of of having a common understanding? I can go on, on that question first, perhaps. I think, and maybe I'll try and answer some of the questions before as well. Um, 
I think it was answered well in the first panel. I think there is a core understanding, and I think it was um, hinted by some of the questions that I think there is perhaps some divergence on the edges, perhaps when you start getting into the detail of um, what well-being might look like in respect to some of the indicators. Um, I suppose there was, a, um, there was an implication that the introduction of well-being has created confusion around when to share information. I think the experience of our work is that that confusion has always been there, um, about when to share information. The introduction of well-being has given us a different narrative around that, but, but professionals have wrestled with these questions all the time. I suppose what we have tried to encourage, I think through some of our work, has felt appropriate in supporting professionals not to see well-being as a, as a lowering of anything or a separate to welfare, but as a, um, as a way of trying to spread our lens, widen our lens about how we, how we view children. So rather than a specific context as a professional that you might be working with a child, maybe concentrating on a very narrow bit of their life and in the school or through your health work, um, you might try and broaden that out and think about the wider context of the child, which is what the Shinari indicators are encouraging you to do. Mm -hmm. And then that has implications when we're talking about um, child's plan, about planning and assessment as well in a more, in a more real sense. Um, but I, I think it is easy and understandable why we can get caught up in conversations about welfare and well-being and different professionals' understanding. Um, but I think broadly it's about an approach rather than uh, it's sort of in trying to move professionals to a more holistic understanding of children rather than the introduction of a specific new category of need. Sorry, I was just agreeing with what Ben was saying there. That, that um, makes sense to myself. Um, I think it is, it's that holistic response. It's recognising that um, children exist um, within their friends, their peer groups, their schools, their home life, their community. Um, and what does wellbeing mean for each individual child? Um, and as professionals, and I think it's come from child protection, Shinari has, um, we are all responsible for the wellbeing and the safety and protection of our children. And I think there is that common ground and understanding of, of wellbeing. Um, but again, I've just, yeah, just widening it out um, around the edges and recognising the various professionalisms that might have something more to bring. Um, health might have something more to add than I would as a social worker. And I think um, it's recognising um, those skills and knowledge as well. And, and would the panel recognise that perhaps, and I, and I suppose I'm taking, speaking from, a, from a, a personal professional point of view, that actually Shinari and Gerfik has given professionals and, and, and others a common language yes. to speak mm. with yeah, when, when we're dealing with yes. child wellbeing and, and child protection yes. issues? Uh, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, certainly from Scottish Prison Service point of view, um, with us being mainly a custodial um, organisation, um, Shinari gives um, much more clarity to the staff who are dealing with young people um, and gives that a common language, if you like. Um, therefore, in, th in case conferences and talking with other professions who are coming in and working in Pullman, um, it means that not only the language but the understanding has definitely been increasing and is, is shared. So that's definitely been an improvement for us. Can I just come back on an earlier um, point about... Um, about the code of practice. And I think since we submitted our, um, our evidence to the committee, I think I've, um, I've been advised and, um, and I've, uh, I've learnt more um, about the, the limitations on a code of practice because of its status in law um, and how much could be included in a code of practice. And I suppose I just wanted to, not to, not to contradict my colleagues, with, uh, which I've, I totally agree with their points about what needs to be available to practitioners, but from my understanding, there are limitations on what can be in the code of practice, meaning that the guidance that accompanies it becomes particularly important. I think that's actually an opportunity because with guidance, statutory or not, there's much more flexibility than I understand can be in the code of practice. So I think our expectations now are perhaps less about seeing lots of changes and introductions to the code of practice as a document, but what sits with it becoming even more important. So what's available to practitioners? Just to say, I think that's not necessarily the evidence we've taken from others who, who feel that the legislation will stand or fall by the ability of the code of practice to give confidence to, to practitioners and to, to those whose information may be shared that it's going to be in, in line with the Supreme Court judgments. I mean, you spoke earlier about there being a chapter that would be different. and I'm not sure, again, whether you think that's in line with what's been expected from the legislation. But basically, if you're saying it's a chapter, you're just collating 
different codes of practice in the one place. I'm not sure if that's... So, no, I, I think we do need um, both some distinction in the code of practice, perhaps between parts four and five, and that's what I was acknowledging about distinguishing those and having separate pages. I think I was picking up on, on, my, on my colleague Donna's point about there being things like practice examples, some sort of case study work and everything else, and my understanding is that it would not necessarily be the easiest thing to do to incorporate that into what is um, quite a legal document where the language used might be quite restrictive. Um, I think we definitely need a code of practice which is clear still um, and accessible still to professionals, but I think that will have to be supplemented by further documentation and work more generally, because documentation and training alone are not going to move us to the culture of information sharing that we want to see in Scotland. Um, so it will need to be accompanied. Those things are essential, but they're not sufficient on their own. Um, so it's about attending to structures of supervision in real time. Who, do, who can professionals turn to for um, advice and guidance about complex cases, um, which we have established processes in social work and in health. Um, and we, in some of our best schools, those things happen too. It's about learning from those and ensuring that those are available to all professionals in all the relevant profession, in all the relevant areas. We have the Cabinet Secretary here and, and uh, it's in November and I'm sure that we'll get clarification sure. about what's not, not exactly what will be in it, but the sort of code of practice and, mm -hmm. and the guidance that goes with it. You may have heard me asking the question to an earlier panel, it's also a question that we've raised in previous evidence mm -hmm. sessions of whether the current situation, the danger of the changes may lead to more defensive practice. So rather than People have been more confident about sharing information. They may be more hesitant, anxious about how they meet the duty to consider the sharing. You know, what would, I wonder whether, A, do you think that may, may be the case? And do you think, in terms of what evidence you need to provide for, I've considered whether to share or not, does that become an extra burden on people in this area? Can I respond to that? Um, from my previous practice um, as a social worker, I was also involved in early and effective intervention, um, which is part of the Scottish Government's whole system approach to supporting young people uh, and children um, at risk or involved in offending. Early and, interve early and effective intervention is for children who are involved in low-level offences between the ages of eight and the day before their 18th birthday. Um, and <clears throat> in relation to... Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. This cold is going. It was about um, defensive practice, wasn't it? Sorry, my apologies. Um, in relation to that, following the Supreme Court judgment, there was, um, from what I can see, is that there was um, examples of people withdrawing from sharing information um, because they were um, anxious, concerned, they weren't sure about um, the, the situation. Um, following that, that has been redressed because I think it's offered an opportunity to um, look at our practice and look at the information that we're actually sharing and making sure it's proportionate and it's appropriate um, and it meets the needs of children. Um, so I think there is a concern that there may be some defensive practice and people may pull back, but I think um, this is really important that we get it right to make sure that we're sharing the right information to ensure that children and their families, where they choose to engage with named person services, can get the right supports um, at the right time to reduce the risk of it escalating. Um, and I think with clear code of practice and additional guidance, um, that, that would support uh, practitioners and children and families to understand what the situation is in relation to sharing information. Um, I agree with that. Um, in respect of ourselves, we um, obviously have a, a moving towards a, a more rights-based approach, but all of our decision-making, um, we look at the proportionality of it, um, and particularly with young people, 16 and 17-year-olds, um, we're very aware of um, both the requirements to work with the young person and their family um, and the lead professional, as well as um, ensuring um, the safety um, of the individual. So um, whilst I think that certainly for us, because it's, it's a, a small proportion of what we do, um, we will need to give our staff um, appropriate support and guidance. Um, I don't see that it would lead to any greater defensibility in terms of decision making. Uh, I want to, call want to come in. I know that Daniel and Ruth have got questions, but they can ask some when they when they ask questions later on. 
I'd like to specifically ask about Child's Plan. Um, children and young people who are perhaps involved in the criminal justice system and also looked after children and young people may need targeted interventions and a Child's Plan could well evolve from that. Um, to what extent is well-being information shared within the existing multi-agency practice? That, so I think picking up on my previous answer, um, if we conceive of well-being as being different components of a child's life, so educational bits of information, health information, um, aspects about their home life and so forth, then it is core to the child's plan and, um, and in relation to looked after children, for there to be a child's plan has been a statutory obligation since 2009 and proceeding as well in different forms. So for us in the looked after child world, um, the introduction of a child's plan part five is, is just sort of consolidating what should already be there. Um, and in relation to the different components of information, which we would conceive of as well-being and, and are describing now, they, a, good, a good plan talks to as many of those as possible in giving a holistic assessment of the child. Looking at uh, parts four and five of the 2014 Act, in part five, the child's plan, there's a duty to share information in relation to the child's plan, but in part four, name person service, the duty is to consider to share information. How is that working? Or how will that work? If you're okay. I can have a first again. I can have a first go, but I, I, my colleagues might have um, different views. I think, so, my area of expertise is around looked after child, uh, children where they have a child's plan already. Um, and for the organisations who are under statutory obligations to provide a range of services and support for those children, information has to be shared in that, in that, in that context for them to undertake their functions. Um, and that is one of the permitted areas on which public organisations can, um, can both store and process information. Um, so in relation to the child's plan aspect, we are comfortable with that duty because it reflects current practice and current statutory obligations. Um, in relation to the consider, that seems appropriate for us. It reflects the contribution we gave to this committee, I think back in 2014, when the original uh, bill, Children and People Bill, was being considered, um, and our concerns that a duty to share for named persons would put at risk what you heard about very eloquently earlier on in terms of um, children's rights to privacy and so forth. Um, so we think a duty to consider adds emphasis um, on professionals to be thinking about whether this is something they should be talking to other professionals about, or more appropriately, probably in the first instance, with other professionals in their organisation, which is not information sharing um, as defined by law, and then with the family as well. So, Do the other witnesses have a comment on that? Uh I, I wouldn't. Um, I mean, the 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 focus um, at the moment would be that the the child's plan would be shared um, when somebody comes into custody if they're a, a looked after child or um, if there a child plan um, exists. Plus, the criminal justice social work report would be shared with us as well. So there already exists um, a case conferencing system which allows that sharing of of information and our. Um, positive future plan which supports the individual's journey through custody um, is also based on the Shinari principle, so about well-being. So in terms of the information that's being shared around about the child's plan and during the period in custody, it is very much focused on well-being and supporting that um, individual. In relation to the, the name person, um, as I said earlier, we will require to support um, our staff and um, it's going to be our level of name person will be a senior management level um, to work through um, the decision making process and to ensure that they are making appropriate decisions um, based on proportionality and the rights of the child. But what we, what we base our work on is about positive engagement um, and absolutely um, we would work to get consent from um, the individual. In terms of sharing the child's plan, is the, are the changes that are coming down the line from Westminster in terms of GDPR and so on, is that going to impact on that at all or, is, or won't it? I, I was just going to say, I would be perfectly honest that um, I have not explored the GDPR um, at this point in time, focusing on the um, Children and Young People Act and where, why we're here today. Um, so that's something I would have to go away and look at um, and uh, consider further. I think we, we um, at Celsius, we, we welcome, I think, what the GDPR is um, 
the, the, again, the, the added obligations. It is going to require, I think, more, more process and more policy um, for a number of organizations. I think we heard from police and other organizations who are going to have to think through what that means for them um, and maybe um, increase or change um, the way they do things. I think in relation to sensitive personal information, I think that's entirely appropriate. I think it builds on what the Data Protection Act um, uh, laid out for the, for the UK. And I think our focus at Celsius is to support our organizations to introduce the necessary mechanisms to meet the GDPR requirements um, in a proportionate way. Could I actually, sorry, just come back in. Obviously, the GDPR, I've, I've heard more about listening this morning and listening to previous committees. Um, and I think um, the, the notion or the importance of consent and explicit consent within that, particularly when we're talking about, well, these lower level concerns that do not require statutory intervention, I think consent and explicit consent and the child's voice and their rights and the family rights are absolutely crucial. Um, and if that's what the GDPR is taking forward, um, then that's a positive step. And again, that's absolutely in line with GERFEC and um, the intentions of, of, of GERFEC as well. But that if I give you a scenario of a young person who may be getting picked up by the police and it's low level stuff, there's a bit of a concern about them, would the current sit or the situation that's been proposed would prevent the police speaking with the guidance staff and saying, I think maybe we've an issue here, can we bring the family in? And where does consent then, how does that apply? When actually what you're trying to, you're seeing just a bit of behaviour early intervention by the police working with the housing department or with the mm -hmm. school or whatever to speak to the family. And you're saying that you would require consent for that, for that sharing? Um, I, think, I suppose I'm, what I'm wrestling with, I get the need to protect and not to share inappropriately, but I'm wondering whether it is inhibiting that very low level early intervention, the signs of stuff coming up here we maybe need to speak to somebody. Absolutely. And I think I would recognise that concern, but I think there's also there, there has to be that balance between. Um, we also have to recognise that parents um, have a role and a responsibility to su to um, support their children. So in the first instance, if a child's been involved or had contact with the police, you would expect the police to speak with that parent and actually the parent caring, um, carer or guardian to take appropriate action to support their child. Now, quite often. Um, if I go back to the early and effective intervention um, process that I spoke about before, quite often um, what was found that the police would, um, in contact with a child, would speak with the child and their parents, advise about the EEI process and about information being shared. And quite often what we found was that parents were actually um, quite happy um, for that information to be shared and for that response. Um, but there was also the, the aspects of that, that where there was no other concerns, this was an incident that um, a young person or a child had been involved in and a parent had dealt with that appropriately. There was no further action required. Mm -hmm. And that absolutely recognised um, the, their choosing to engage in that process and also their actions within that. There are other circumstances where supports and interventions were provided, um, but we had engagement and consent from um, the parents. The police would gather that at the first contact, um, and then that was taken forward. But I think the, um, the, the proposed bill is making us explore that in more detail um, as to how, that, how, how we gain consent um, and the full meaning of explicit consent and making sure that people understand that. I just think if maybe a young person can be a bit troubled, something happens out in the community. Actually, if you spoke to the school, they say, well, yeah, there, are, there is something happening here. We're not, we're not ringing up huge alarm bells, yeah. but we need to have a conversation about it. I'm just wondering whether you think this legislation makes those conversations more or less likely. I'm not talking about speaking to parents, because obviously they would do that. But that kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's not just an incident, it's actually a pattern of behaviour that's developing and people aren't picking up the clues. And I'm just, I, I suppose my concern is, which I'm looking to have a, a laid by you, is that it wouldn't inhibit that normal, let's have a word with a guidance teacher or whomsoever, is this something that's happened in school as well? You know, and that then forms, in fact, probably the conversation with the family as well. You framed it in terms of would it would it inhibit or would it encourage? I think almost that kind of information sharing. I think the legislation um, that we're looking at today, I think, um, would 
encourage on that side, but it would also, and that's why the code of practice is so important, it would encourage that, that, that it's done in an appropriate and legal way. Um, I think maybe some of the concerns um, in the end that were um, uh, dealt with by the Supreme Court were about previous versions of the duties um, put at risk certain other um, rights of children and their families. I think in this context, I think it's encouraging professionals to be thinking about when it's appropriate to reach out to other professionals, and again, most importantly, to the family and others. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move on down. Sure. Yeah. Um, First of all, can I just ask the, 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 the bold, blunt question? You know, given that, that this legislation doesn't change what can be shared, it's about essentially obligating practitioners to consider sharing. Do you think that the, 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 the legislation we're looking at helps practice or is, uh, hinders it or makes no difference? I think the fact that we're sitting here today, I think the fact that the legislation is generating a debate, although a difficult debate at times, but, but I think a necessary one, I think the opportunity that the code of practice and subsequent guidance all gives us, I think are essential for us moving forward with clarifying and creating what I referred to earlier as an information sharing culture that is positive about securing the best outcomes for children. Um, so although I think an analysis might say that um, the existing legislative framework is uh, robust enough um, and sufficient for this work to go on, which I think is <coughs> what was implied by your question, um, I think this bill in the Scottish contexts adds extra emphasis and for, for, for GERFEC in encouraging professionals to be thinking about the focus is on the child, and how can I secure the best outcome for this child? So I think I welcome it on that on that basis. Um, I think the the proposed bill. Um, I think I've already said this one. I think it's very difficult as a practitioner that you would have to have the Children Young Person Act, the Human Rights Act, and the Data Protection and Data Protection Schedule Two and Data Protection Schedule Three. And people have already mentioned GDPR that's coming in as well. Um, and I can be perfectly honest and say my head is confused, and I've had time to read through this. Um, and I think it's it is not easy. Um, to make that decision, and I think that's where we sit with the emphasis is on the code of practice. Um, it's not that this uh, should not be going through or taken forward, um, but I think certainly the code of practice and any additional guidance will be what actually makes this applicable um, uh, and its implementation in the real world. I would agree with that. I listened in to some of the commentary earlier um, from um, practitioners, and I think it is um, welcome. Um, it strengthens what's already there. It will provide more clarity, um, and I think um, that that will be positive um, and improve outcomes for younger people. So just coming back on that a little bit, I, I mean, I think what, what you're all saying is that, that, that essentially it's useful to have the discussion and, and debate to talk about what good practice looks like. Do we need legislation to facilitate that, or, or should we be looking at kind of a, a policy, you know, policy-led? I mean, could, could we not just do this by in, encouraging better practice, better policy, and doing it through, through those means rather than bringing forward legislation? I suppose we've, at Celsius, we've, we've come to the conclusion, we, we submitted a response which I think, um, which articulated um, our feeling, I think reflected in, in other responses, that the current legislative framework would probably be sufficient. But I think we've come to the conclusion in relation to this bill um, that it can make a positive contribution um, to continuing to build in Scotland um, what we need in terms of um, appropriate positive information sharing um, in in the boundaries of both the Data Protection Act and, in the future, the, um, the, the new directives from the European Union. I'm, I'm just very slightly confused by your response there, because in your written submission, um, in the second paragraph, you say that, unfor unfortunately, the, the bill, and more importantly, um, the draft code of practice, do not achieve, and, it, and, and it's referring to uh, clarification of the complex issues around information sharing, and that you're saying that that, that, that lack of clarity is putting at risk the, the wider GARFAC agenda. Are, are you saying that you, you, you've subsequently changed your mind? You're asking me about the legislation? So yeah. that, that very much in relation to the code of practice, that. So um, we were not and continue to be not 
entirely happy with the language that was used, I think, as you've heard from a range of evidence. But I understand, having followed this process that you've been under, that there's already been concessions. I think that, that that's, and I think we heard from this morning, some organisations already involved in the redrafting of that and thinking about what, what goes beyond that. I think in that response, we were coming at that and thinking that the code of practice would be the entire guidance that would be available for, for people around information sharing. And now, subsequently, we understand that that won't be the case. Okay. So, so, so finally, given the importance then of, of, of the code of practice, not just in terms of practicality for practitioners, but really actually in terms of making this work and being compliant with all the other bits of legislation that Donna McCune was just outlining, do you not think that its status within the bill needs to be elevated, rather than it just essentially being a, a creature of, of uh, ministers, that it, it should be subjected to, to wider parliamentary scrutiny uh, 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 you know, because of its importance and centrality to, to making this work both practically and legally? Oh, no, that's like the whole panel. If I understood the question, can I, can I clarify the question, yeah, which is that should the, the core elements of the code of practice be incorporated into the law? Is yes. that what's... And be subject to parliamentary scrutiny. So I'm going to have to take lead into, uh, guidance from you, I suppose, in respect to what the 40 days of um, what, I, what I interpreted as parliamentary scrutiny actually looks like. So as I understood, there is already a requirement for the Scottish Government to lay before Parliament for 40 days the code of practice. Um, I don't know what process then is undertaken in terms no of subject that. Subject parliamentary approval. Parliament, okay, so it, it's, it's just for your comment and, and, and feedback. I think, it's, I think it's important that it gets proper scrutiny. Um, I'm not sure I have a firm view on whether that needs to be at this level of, of detail. I think a range of organisations are already in, engaging in a very active way, both the Scottish Government and through this process and others, to try and ensure that what is published by the Scottish Government is robust. Um, we've seen over the past four years that this is an area that a range of organisations take extremely seriously and are willing to go to the furthest lengths possible to try and ensure that both children's rights and families' rights are maintained. Um, so I suppose I'm working on the basis that that scrutiny will continue to be applied to these next stages. And finally, Ruth. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning and thanks for being here. I've um, appreciated all your evidence so far. It's always a bit challenging coming in at the end because we've covered so much so much ground. But I think, um, and we have touched on this, thinking about um, moving to that culture of information sharing that um, Ben mentioned there. I think we all agree that effective and proportionate information sharing is important in improving outcomes for our um, young people um, and children. Just what further progress do you think we have to make in that regard? And I suppose the, the, the crucial bit for me is how do we best create confidence amongst practitioners to do that, to share information um, better and to improve outcomes for um, looked after young people and young people in the criminal justice system? Thanks. Um, I think for, uh, in the main, uh, there is, for young people already involved in the criminal justice system um, and looked after and accommodated children, so that's certainly not my area of, of knowledge, so Ben will be able to add to that. Um, there is, in the main, good information sharing for, by the very fact that um, a child has appeared in court, been found guilty, and there's a criminal justice social work report being requested, um, or um, a referral to the children's report, a children's panel being called on offence grounds. Um, then there's those duties to share information. Um, so I think in those situations, and I think we already said, there is good information sharing. Um, and again, it comes down to relationships with the individual um, and being clear about what information uh, and who you're going to share with or who you're going to speak to. And as far as possible, having getting their consent so that they fully understand um, who's going to know what. Um, and what people are not going to know, which is also really important. Um, I think practitioners in that level, again, are, are quite confident. It's the the, um, the non-statutory, the non-duty um, situations. And I think being clear, case examples, um, speaking to practitioners, they value case examples. And it's not to give them a tick box exercise. It's to give them different ideas as that they can look at and identify with their own practice. Um, and I think absolutely being clear about the role of consent and the importance of consent and explicit consent um, within sharing information at those um, um, non-statutory, non-duty sharing um, levels, I think. Okay. Um, 
I think that um, for us, there, um, there, there is a good um, structure already in place. Um, I think it's about more clarity around about pathways and obviously consistency in approach. And I think that consistency in approach can also only lend confidence to the young person in terms of their engagement, not only um, with the child's plan, but obviously with the, the plan um, whilst they're in custody. I'm smiling because I suppose it's 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 what we do on a on a day-to-day -day basis. It's also trying to um, support organisations to to move to that new culture or, or to or or to sustain that great culture that they've already got. Um, I think what I took from your question is what more do we need to do? Learning from those places where they are doing it well, and I think um, our experience of those of those areas, both geographical or organisational, where do it well, are those who have attended to different aspects in terms of their structure. Are they structured well? Do they have proper processes of supervision and support for professionals in relation to information sharing, but a wider range of practice? Do they have good systems in terms of data storage um, and data recording, meeting their requirements that will be enhanced now um, through the new EU directives um, that, that concentrate on ensuring that their professionals can build positive relationships, as, as was spoken about, with, with families and with, and with children. And I think that would be true of the adult sector too. Um, a lot of the questions that we're rightly discussing um, fade away where there is good trust and good relationships between professionals and where families and children understand that information is being stored and shared for their benefit, um, not for the benefit of services. Um, and, if we can, if we, if we, and if we can create systems in each of our sectors, whether it's education, social work or health, um, that, that operate on that model, um, then we go a long way to moving through some of these concerns. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, that's uh, the end of the question session. I'd like to thank the panel members for the time this morning and for answering all our questions. Uh, and that concludes the public part of the meeting today. I shall spend for a moment or two to allow the witnesses and anyone observing in the public gallery to leave before continuing on to the next item of business in private. Thank you.